Today's topic is a continuation of pressure vessels. Okay, where's the center? Okay, so three quarters, we'll put that here. This is three quarters PR over T. So then that means your circle is going to, to bound that, it's going to pass through PR over, oh, I don't want that. PR over T and PR over 2T, right? That's what your circle looks like? Good. So what is your, by looking at this, you can see that even though we have shear stress equal to zero on that theta R Z orientation, if you look at a little patch of material that's inclined at a different angle on that um, surface, it will have shear stress. Um, okay, the other thing we can do is we said that the radial stress was zero, right? That was one of our assumptions, is that that normal stress in the radial direction is zero. So if that's the case, we then get two other diagrams. So our absolute maximum shear stress, turns out, is not in the plane of the shell. It's actually, or as you rotate it, um, kind of in, you rotate it about a different axis, not in the plane of the shell. So then we can look at cylindrical uncapped. Which of these two pressures stays the same? PR over T, okay, so this would be PR over T. But now the other one is zero, right? So that gives us more circle that looks like this. I didn't really, here, let me, let me make these a little bit more to scale. So now the plane of the rotating it in the plane of that uh, that shell, the thin thin shell, you actually get a bigger Mohr circle, one that matches the biggest Mohr circle from the cylindrical cap. And now, if you want to rotate it about the other two axes, they both are going to have to pass through zero. So one looks identical to what we already have, and the other one just looks like a dot at zero. And then we can, of course, look at spherical. See if you can draw the more circle for spherical. Yes. Where's this one? Was three quarter. So, what does the Mohr circle look like for spherical? I'm not following. This one here? Okay. Okay. Um, so you have one point that's at PR over 2T. But what's the stress in the other direction, the other normal stress? Is it zero? Yeah. 
It's the same value, right? So our in-plane stress, so if you rotate an element in the theta z direction on a spherical pressure vessel, you just get a dot. There's no shear stress at all in the plane of that um, surface of that pressure vessel. But where do you see shear stress? It's if you rotate, if you look at an orientation that is out of plane. So if you kind of rotate your, if you look at a chunk of material that instead of being aligned with the surface, you rotate it so that it has a component going in the radial direction, then you're going to see some shear stress in that direction. But it'll be significantly smaller than either of these other two, right? Because this little circle is um, what he indicated here as being the same as this little circle. It's just that. What's the value of the point? The value of the point? Yes. It tells you that in that plane you never experience shear stress. Is it PR or Oh, that's what you mean. Yes. Um, I was thinking existential there. Uh, PR over 2D. All right, so I wanted to show you these more circles just because throughout this whole class, I want you to be thinking about the big picture. I, you know, in, when they talk about pressure vessels in the textbook, it is all of a few pages. It's one section, and they just kind of say, oh, PR over T, PR over 2T. That's all you ever need to know. There's no shear stress in a pressure vessel. That's fine, as long as we're only ever talking about those orientations, right? The minute you want to know, like, is this material experiencing shear stress at all, now that's a totally different question, and it is. And if you don't think about these more circles, you may not uh, capture that. So the last one, the circle. Yes. So technically, it's experiencing the least uh, pressure, or not pressure. Least shear least stress. Shear stress. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So for this example, we have a pipe that is supported every twenty feet. And those supports do not allow the pipe to move at that location. And we want to determine the longitudinal and the circumferential stresses if we have pressurized liquid with 600 pounds per square inch. And while this pressurized liquid is flowing, we have a temperature rise of 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And the inner pipe diameter is 20 inches, and our pipe thickness is a quarter inch. And once again, we have A36 still. Right, so what piece of this puzzle would you like to pursue first? The thermodynamics part. <laughs> Sorry. Um, is, that, is there a second on that? All right. That wasn't where I was going to go. But OK, so let's, <laughs> let's, let's start with the hard part. There's a temperature increase. What does that temperature increase do to the material? It causes it to want to expand. Okay, so that expansion is going to be the same in all directions. So we're going to tend to see a expansion of the diameter, which in turn is an expansion of the circumference. Now keep in mind all these equations that we use do not apply at the supports. They apply away from the supports, right? Because there's going to be diff more complex stress states going on at the supports. So at the supports, that diametrical expansion would be restricted, but in the body of this pipe, it's free to expand. Okay. More or less, I mean, assuming that the pressure of the fluid doesn't prevent it. Okay, we're not gonna get that, that picky. So the point is, we don't generate any stresses caused by the diameter expanding, but in the length, because it's restricted at those two points, now you're developing stress because it wants to expand, but it's not allowed to expand. So if you look at this material, so say it starts at like that, and it wants to expand by some amount del T, and what's the equation for how much it wants to expand? Well, 
Let's go with alpha L delta T. But we may come back to that other answer, just so don't let it go too far. All right, so this is the amount that it wants to expand if we have an increase of temperature. And it wants to move, say, to the right. But we know that it cannot move. So therefore, this difference, this uh, kind of existential contraction, which is not actually happening, but in sort of happening because it's preventing the extension, we'll say that amount of contraction has to relate to the amount of force that's developed in the pipe. So what is the equation for, what is the equation that relates force to deformation? Uh, that's where we got it from, yes. And then we, we, we started with generalized Hooke's law and then we customized it for axial loading. And what did it become? PL over AE. So what I'm saying is that we're going to develop some force in this pipe. And when you multiply that force by the length and divide by AE, you'll get the amount of deformation that, it, that it's preventing from occurring. And that amount of deformation is equal to the amount of deformation that wants to occur due to the temperature, which is computed as alpha L delta T. So we'll say that this expansion has to be equal to that contraction. So the deformation from temperature has to be equal to the deformation from force. So we can say alpha. We're going to need to look up the alpha value for A36 steel. Can you talk a little bit about why you can use Sorry. Sure. So the deformation, it wants to expand. Free expansion would cause it to deform this amount, del T. Yes, because of the heat. But we're preventing that from occurring. So whether we're preventing it from occurring or whether we're actually contracting, it's the same mathematically. There's a certain amount of deformation that we're preventing, and that it's when we're talking about stresses it's being prevented because of these pieces so so if we were to look at this piece and that piece and we had the thermal expansion it would want to extend here and here so that would be your del t and then we're saying nope you have to stay where you were so therefore that i'm, I'm calling it like a, i'm calling it a traction, but it never really expanded. It wanted to expand, and it's the amount of expansion that we stopped. So those, those aren't holding it this way and this way? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes, yes, they're preventing it from, ex sure from moving at all. Correct. Um, uh, well, well, what did you say was preventing the diameter? Oh, these supports here. So supports not only support it in place, like from moving up and down, but they also support it from moving left and right. Correct. Correct. And they don't allow the diameter to expand at that point. But we're, all of these stresses we're computing are, say, here in the middle. Yeah. yeah. So it would make more sense if they were metal instead of this concrete looking material. <laughs> but yes. Um, so now are we kind of all on the same page? Okay, so now we can say that, ex that expansion and, com and contraction are equal. And so we need an alpha value for, for steel, and it is 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 6. And that is specific for Fahrenheit. You have a different value if you're dealing with Celsius. And we're also going to need E. That one you should know. What's E? Perfect, 29,000. Okay, so we have 6.6 .6 times 10 to the negative 6 times L, which is 20 feet, and times delta T, which is 60 degrees Fahrenheit. I could convert that feet to inches, but it's going to be on the other side of the equation as well, so I know they're going to cancel out. So I set that equal to PL over AE. 
Now, in this problem, we're solving for stresses, correct? So I could plug in the actual area and solve for the force, but then to get the stress, I'm going to have to divide it by the area again. So instead, I can just say that A over E is equal to sigma, sigma Z. And then here, I'll say sigma Z times L over E. So 29,000 KSI. And that tells us that sigma Z is equal to 11.5 KSI. So in this case, because we are not allowing the pipe to expand, even though there's no stress in that longitudinal direction due to the pressurized fluid, there is stress due to that restrained motion. So that's one of our stress components. How do we go about getting the other stress component? And what is the other stress component? What's that? The uh, circumferential stress. I think that's what that you, you meant, yeah. So sigma theta, and how do we calculate that? So it's PR over T. And now I, I heard a question, why don't we just do twice yeah. the, uh, so if, if the sigma Z were calculated due to pressure, then we could just double it. But in this case, it's a different phenomenon. It's not due to the pressure of the liquid. Okay, so PR over T, we have our pressure, which is 600. What's that? Expanding longitudinals, expanding on the z direction, especially in the any stress in the theta direction. Mm, no, the pressure, the, the liquid is applying pressure all along the inside of that tank. So it will have the, the hoop stress. So 60 psi times the inner radius, which is 10 inches, divided by the thickness, which is 0.25 inches. And that gives us a value of 24 KSI. Yes. Um, in this class, yes. And oftentimes, these, you know, the displacements that we're dealing with are very small, so mathematically it's going to be negligible whether you use the initial or the final. And oftentimes we use the initial because that is something that we know with certainty, whereas it might be hard to measure instantaneously what it would be. But it does bring up an interesting point because if you, if you really think too much about these problems, they get a lot more complicated. Because, right, you have that interaction between the pressure and the expansion of that diameter, which in this problem it just assumes that you can free expand in that diameter without the pressure preventing it. Um, but realistically, that may not be the case. You, know, you may have part of that you know, expansion, which is trying to come inward, being pushed up against by the pressure. And so there's an interaction there. Other questions? Yes, had we not had a temperature change, we would have started with sigma theta and then we would have said sigma z is equal to zero. Had there not been a temperature change, right. we would have said that sigma theta was equal to 24 KSI. We would have done that first. And then in the the second step, which would be to get sigma z, we would say that it's equal to zero because there's no stress being generated by the pressure itself because of these open ends, the, the fluid flows out. 